swim, bike, run. This is Endurance FM with Graham Brown. Hello, welcome to Endurance FM. We are all about the entrepreneurs of endurance. My name is Graham Brown. What does it take to be part of the fittest tribe alive? Well, we'll find out today because we're joined by its founder. He's a master lifestyle coach, a successful entrepreneur who's completed the world's toughest mother twice. He's completed 54 non-stop hours of brutal Navy SEAL training twice. And wait, there's more. He recently joins us from climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sports business. Sports business. Welcome to the show all the way from Maui, Hawaii, Luke Kayam. Graham, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Awesome to have you here. Maui, what a place to build your fitness business. How is it there today, Luke? Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's the most beautiful weather in the world. It's about 78 degrees year-round, a little bit of rain, a little bit of sunshine, and a lot of ocean. Amazing. You've recently traded places. You were in Africa climbing mountains. You've just come back from that not so long ago. What's the story there? Uh, Mount Kilimanjaro is the largest single standing volcano in the world, meaning it's not attached to any other mountain. So uh, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. It was probably one of the greatest and most eye opening experiences of my life. And I'm obviously in the experience business. So it was really great to travel to, you know, Africa, third world country that I'd never been to before. And mm -hmm. the craziest start really part about this story is that it almost didn't happen. So I, I left here uh, and I, I got to the airport and unfortunately I had to make a few commutes. I got on the puddle jumper and I ended up spending 90 minutes on the tarmac uncontrollably, nothing I could do about it. The traffic in Los Angeles at LAX was absolutely terrible on the tarmac at the airport. We're not even talking about on the freeway. <laughs> Traffic was so bad at LAX that we spent 90 minutes on the tarmac, and when it was time to get off the plane, I had to run full speed to get to where I was going, to get to my gate. And when I got there, I saw the plane, and you know they said, sorry, sir, we're not taking anyone else. And three of my buddies were actually already on the airplane, wow. and I think I could do about it. So along with two or three other guys that were also on that same commuted flight, uh, we got bumped 24 hours. Well, that next flight was full, so we actually had to go on standby. We actually got exited out of the airport at LAX, and I, I actually did a, a vlog on this. I couldn't believe what was happening, that such great intentions of getting to the airport early and packing and you know, double photocopies of your passport and extra chapstick and absolutely everything <laughs> you imagine, and you can't control things. So I had a lot of resistance. Yeah, right. The next 24 hours I spent at my, my best friend in the world's house in L.A., so that wasn't the challenge. I get on the plane, and I'm getting ready to spend you know the next 24 hours flying, and my computer, my MacBook Air breaks, my screen breaks. No way. And there's no Wi-Fi on the airplane. and So instead of continuing to fight this resistance that I can tell is coming at me from every direction, uh, I decide to go with the flow. We finally get to Amsterdam. From Amsterdam, we commute to Kili, to Tanzania, and we get to Tanzania, and it's midnight, a day later, and my bags aren't there. So by this time, I've the resistance is gone. Whatever's going to get thrown at me, I am ready for, even the bags being lost, because how we packed, and this is great, you know, for everybody out there, you can always prepare. You, you train, you supplement, you fuel you sleep, you recover, but how how do you train for not having the right gear or mm. them losing the gear that you're supposed to have that's supposed to be right? So we, we kind of knew there was a small chance this could happen. So what we did is we carried two carry-ons. And when I say we, I mean my team is my family, my wife, my two kids back home in the States. And a suitcase that we checked through, well, the carry-on, the second carry-on had everything in it that would give me just enough to get through a week had they lost my bag. So one pair of boots, one pair of socks, one pair of underwear, one Lara bar, one instant coffee, one coconut oil, 
versus the seven to 10 days worth of gear that I had carried through. So imagine you get to Africa, you're ready to roll, and all you have is these two carry-ons. Mm. By this time, it's been 38 hours since I left LAX. The next day, we're starting our hike. And I'm ready. And it didn't even matter what else could possibly happen. I was disconnected, no Wi-Fi. I checked in with my wife knowing I probably wasn't going to be able to call her for a few days. She also knew the emergency rule. For all you men out there, husbands and fathers, you've got to have the emergency rule. And the emergency rule is if you don't hear from me by this date and time, then you need to start looking for me. And these are the three people that you need to have come help find me. So we cleared all those things. We got started uh, at Kilimanjaro, zero uh, feet. We started. The best part about it is that you really do start at sea level. And 19,341 feet later, uh, we reached the top. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much going on there. Did you, you know, you, you started that hike, well, it's more than a hike up to the top of the mountain. They'd lost your luggage. You'd been traveling for 30 odd hours with probably very little sleep. You'd been delayed, all kinds of nonsense going on. Were you mentally in the right place to take on that mountain? Graham, I didn't mention middle seat, both like <laughs> Middle all right. seat. All right. And that as well. Mindset you know, wise, were you good? Were you like, whatever happens going to happen? Or were you just kind of like, I mean, how were you dealing with that? Yeah, so great question. I, I, I believe that you can't fight the universe. When the universe tells you something, you have to follow it. It's, whether you call it one of the unwritten laws of, of life, uh, the law of attraction, whatever you want to call it, the laws cannot be fought, or at least not well. So, you know, I had resistance even leaving my home because my kids were like, Dad's gone for two weeks and it's Christmas time. Like we, we had set up Christmas probably the day after Halloween this year, knowing that dad was going to be gone for two weeks. Right. Just my kids could deal with that situation. So there had been so much resistance built up that by the time my bag was lost, I was laughing about it. Mm -hmm. And I was ready for the mountain because all that mattered, all that mattered to me was that not I was there, not that I was going on the hike, but I had to summit because summit is not guaranteed. So for me, nothing else mattered. It didn't matter about my computer. I could get it fixed. It didn't matter that I w didn't have cell service. It didn't matter that I had to wear the same underwear inside out and round side of route for seven days. I actually bought a couple pair of socks in Africa, but I, I, ch I chose to white out my skins because those were the best protection I could. And I did, I did clean them a little, guys. I did walk <laughs> but nothing else mattered to me, not even my family at home. Not my business, not my clients. Nothing mattered except for summiting. Mm. So I had to, I had to get my myself in gear. I had to get my mind right. And th that night that I finally got to the hotel at midnight, I'm taking malaria pills because you have to do that in that region of the world. My computer screen's broken. I have these check-on bags. I'm 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 calling my wife because I still had phone service. I'm crying. I'm, I'm, this is no joke, Graham. I'm being as honest as it gets. I'm bawling. And I'm like, what the f am I doing here across this world? What am I doing? I could have gone for a hike. All my people, including my father-in-law who lives in Beirut, is like, you are crazy for doing this. Right. You know, all these people. I'm like, I I'm here. I just need to go to bed. I need to get up and I need to make this shit happen. And I need to get after it. And I did. It was a rough night. I woke up in the morning, met the team for breakfast, and I borrowed a couple things that I didn't have, and, and we got to work. Mm. And, you know, that, that hike is so special. It's special to a lot of people, but it's special because of the people that are there, the, the porters, uh, the people of Africa, the people of Tanzania and Kilimanjaro. That's what made it magical. That's the perspective that I had when I was there was how amazing this was being here knowing that I didn't have to deal with the emails, with the text messages, with the kids, with the school. I didn't have to worry about the bills. I didn't have to worry about the food. All I had to do was hike, I had to take care of my feet, I had to take care of my body, I had to make sure I fueled right and they, and they, 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 they overfed us. They really did take care of us, the unit that they were with company by the name of G Adventures. Mm. 
I mean, I'm talking fried eggs and hot dogs on the side of 17,000 feet before wow. our sun. It was absolutely amazing. So we did it day by day. Uh, I, one more great story that I got to jump in here before we, we change it. subjects. But the night before I left, as I'm packing my bag and my wife's telling me, you need to pack this carry-on bag, a good friend of mine says, are you taking a GoPro? And I said, no, nah, I didn't really think about it. You know, I haven't gotten a new GoPro. It's been a couple years. Didn't really like the last ones that much. He goes, go get the GoPro. Uh, you know, I believe it's called the Hero. One button on, one button off. Go get it. I'm like, all right, cool. So I go to Best Buy, which is, you know, a business out here in the States where you can go buy electronics. I buy it. It's packaged. It's sitting on my desk. Well, it's time to start packing all this stuff up. I figure i got to charge these things. I open it up. I have to put the mini scan disc, which is what it records all the data on, yeah. in this tiny little cube. And it's midnight. I'm just absolutely beat up already. And I end up shoving the card in backwards and upside down. So I break, <laughs> I break the GoPro. This is midnight, and I'm sitting there, everything in my mind, my flight leaves at 11, Best Buy doesn't open until 10, I'll never make it, what am I going to do? Not only did I just spend 300 bucks on all this, but I want to use it! <laughs> I know my iPhone is going to suck on the side of a mountain at near zero degree temperatures. So, again, I consider myself to be good at a lot of things, great at a few, but absolutely excellent at a tiny amount of things, and one of those things is making things happen, like right. finding way. So my thought process, mine started to kick into full gear and I realized that Walmart was open 24 hours. Well, I'm going to go to Walmart. I'm going to buy the exact same setup again. I'm going to ask the guy to show me how to put it in or watch a YouTube video. I got it right this time. And I'm going to have my wife or my assistant or somebody back here in the States return that GoPro to the other store, say it's a user error. Boom, bow, ping, all those things worked out. My GoPro comes with me. I filmed the entire seven-day experience on one GoPro, one uh, a, uh, battery pack, one third-party battery pack that I took with me that I charged my iPhone and my GoPro on for literally seven days, and I got some of the greatest footage I could ever imagine in my life on that thing. So yeah. all, all you got to find ways to make it happen in life, in business, in relationships, with your kids, with yourself, with your fitness, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happens to you. There's no such thing as failure, only temporary defeat. Yeah, right. And I've seen the I've seen the footage as well. It's on YouTube. It's amazing. Some of it, just glorious. Right. Like you know, the the landscapes, everything. So go and check it out. We'll put links in the show notes as well. Awesome. Hey, Luke, I want to share something with you that you wrote about. You may have forgotten that you wrote this, so it may come back to haunt you, but I think it's sort of fitting in the context of what we're talking about. You wrote a story about when you were a kid and you were wrapping up your freshman basketball team, right? And you had basically made a decision to quit the basketball team and you didn't have the guts to go and approach your coach, right? And you got your close friend to go and do this for you and have this chat. And you, I know you said... At the time, this is something that would come back and haunt you for years later on. I'm thinking about this in the context of this conversation about not quitting and climbing Kilimanjaro. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Well, I can tell you right now, you've done your research, Graham, and I took <laughs> that right there, bringing up freshman basketball. So I've divorced my old self. I no longer am connected to the 17 to 23 six or seven year old kid that used to be called Luke Kayyem for several reasons. Mm. And one of them was he allowed himself to quit. He didn't know better. It wasn't his fault. He didn't have the proper coaching or teaching and he didn't have enough insight to go and learn these things on his own. So I don't blame him, but I also need to own what I did. And I made a lot of mistakes during those years, as a lot of high school kids do. But for me, I grew up without a father figure. My mom did the best that she could. She had me at the late age of 43. So by the time I was in high school, she's pushing 60 years old. Mm. And she didn't care as long as I went to school and came home. Nothing else truly really did matter too much. So I was a three-sport athlete most of my years growing up, baseball, basketball, and football. We got to freshman year, had a successful football season, and rolled right into basketball. 
And you got to make the team. So I obviously was good enough to make the basketball team. What happened at that time was I believe that I fell into the trap of excuses. And my good friend, I won't mention his name, Jeremy Eld. She probably won't listen to this. <laughs> but I may send this to him to share this with him, hopefully to fire him up. Because that still haunts me to this day right. that I didn't have enough guts to do it myself, that I didn't have enough guts to finish the season, and that I didn't have enough guts to stick it out. Mm. Why does that even, haunt you? Uh, it, it's painful because I don't have a, a, an ounce of quit in my body. And mm. I've spent the last probably 18, 19, 20 years proving to myself that I am so much greater than what I once was during some of those years. Mm. And you call it a chip on your shoulder. You call it a stigma. You call it, you know, just making up for lost time. I believe that's what I'm doing right now in my life is doing absolutely everything I possibly can to get as much out of myself in my life as possible. And quitting is just an easy way to give up. So my buddy Jeremy showed up for practice, obviously the beginning of practice, because who would get through practice, mm. right? You never quit after practice. You always quit before. And he walked up to my teacher. I remember his name. I can close my eyes and picture where, what, what it looked like and what it smelled like, Palm Springs, California, in Southern California. And he said, hey, Mr. Linus, man, you know, um, I'm not going to play anymore. And Linus said, oh, really? And why is that? He said, well, you know, a couple excuses or two. And I stood three feet behind him. And afterwards, Coach Linus looked at me and said, you too? And I remember all I did was nod my head. I couldn't even say, yeah, me too. I just nodded my head. And it didn't even affect me. It didn't affect me that year. It didn't affect me for the next three years that I continued to play high school sports or even some junior college sports. It didn't affect me for five years. It affected me when I started teaching people the importance of showing up and not quitting. Mm. And I realized, well, I, showing up is only one thing. That's a great piece for anybody to become more successful. But you also can't quit. So with the very first gym I ever opened back in 2006, uh, CrossFit Scottsdale, our mantra was to show up. Don't quit. That's it. It's all you had to do. Nothing else really mattered. Well, we kind of took a piece of that now into 2017. And there's a very famous quote out there by Woody Allen that says 80 to 90% of success is just showing up. So true. So now it's a staple on my license plate. Hmm. And every single person I come in contact with, including my kids, and here's another example of not quitting. My daughter and I joined a fight gym called Fight Ready here in North Scottsdale that does MMA and jiu-jitsu. And she wanted to quit after the second week. I said, that's fine. You can quit after you get your yellow belt. Mm -hmm. You've already come now for two or three weeks. If you want to quit, that's fine. And I, what I'm thinking in my head is, had I had a dude or a dad like me that I might have approached in high school and I said, Dad, I'm going to quit the freshman basketball team, maybe that dude or dad would have been like, all right, that's fine. You can quit after the season's over. But you're not going to quit before that because you've already committed to your team, you've committed to your school, you've committed to yourself, and you're obviously good enough to play the sport, so you might as well just finish the next six weeks or so until it's over. Those are the kind of constant nudges I put not only in my clients' head and, and heart, but in my own kids. Mm. These are powerful and, lessons, and I want to go back to that. I mean, you talked, you mentioned already that you grew up um, in a single parent family with your mom and you know not having that kind of father figure around to give you those nudges and you know those times when maybe you were feeling like quitting or I know you, you mentioned other experiences as well not having that sort of sit down conversation with your dad or you know having a cigar or anything like that right you know you kind of mentioned these sort of experiences which are all part of growing up and you share those with your your father right yeah. and now you're in a situation where you're teaching other people You've gone through this really interesting process where, you know, you became a teacher and you've inspired people and you, you've got the better out of people in life. But you've always kind of like, I don't I use the word lightly, fell into that from an early age, right? You were kind of like drawn into that profession. And I want to talk about how you sort of got to start in your own businesses as well. And there's these really interesting stories that you mentioned. There's this first one where you're teaching kids rock climbing, but also where your mom becomes your first fitness client, 
right? Yeah. So I'm really, you sort of, you know, that was kind of part of your destiny from an early age, right? I'm really curious to how you see that and how you sort of got your start in this business. Yeah, so everything has to start with purpose. You know, what is your purpose? And for a long time, I questioned that. But now looking back on it, I go, oh, there's the aha moment. I was six. My mom didn't want to go outside and play with me. And I didn't have any siblings. So I hit a tennis ball with a tennis racket up against the fence. And that's how I learned to play tennis. Hmm. Now, I learned how to do that playing baseball. And I learned how to do that playing football. And I could throw the ball up really high. I learned how to play my, with myself no pun intended, but I learned how to do that at a very young age. So I learned how to coach myself. I learned how to hack my life at a young age because I had no other option. I had no other choice. I also grew up in Hawaii where you're outside a lot and you're always playing sports. So not only did that have that combination of ultimate creativity within who I was, but I also had the freedom to go and showcase it and go surfing, and go outside and fly kites and go swimming and go fishing and get to do all these things in the great outdoors, which now is probably one of the biggest reasons why I love being outside. So fast forward a few years and my mom is now starting to get a little bit older and she was actually a psychotherapist. So not only did I learn from her growing up as a normal kid would come home from school and mom would say, how was school? And son would say, fine. A psychotherapist mom says, come sit on my couch so we can talk. Right. It's just a little bit deeper. But I learned to ask the right questions. And too often in life, we ask the wrong questions or we don't ask questions at all. So I'm 19 years old. I realized I didn't want to keep going to college because I wasn't playing sports anymore. I really wanted to make money. I didn't know what I wanted to be. So I start parking cars. And, you know, these are nice high end cars in Southern California. And I'm making good money, but I'm making great money because I'm running faster than everyone else. So not only am I getting tipped more, one of my first lessons in true entrepreneurship on how to hustle, not only am I getting tipped more because there's more volume, I'm getting tipped more money because they're seeing the work ethic that I create. Mm. So about this time, I'm like making a ton of money. I'm living at home. It's a cash business. I get a job at the local gym, the Globo gym. And I learned right away the very basic principles of health and fitness and training. But I learned it while I was answering the front desk, the phone, while I was checking people in. And within a few weeks, I got the opportunity to teach little kids how to climb a rock wall, a self-repelling rock wall. And then a few weeks later, I showed up for opening day of become a trainer. And then a few weeks later, I just took it all in. I, I went home. I talked to my mom. My mom said, you know what? I'm going to support you. Why don't you start training me two days a week and I'm going to pay you. So I had my first paying client, which was my mom, which she actually kept the money and didn't charge me rent. Mm -hmm. So everybody was winning and I was learning. And I, more than anything, I had a purpose. Mm. Well, that purpose stayed with me for my entire career. We mentioned it earlier before we got on the recording, but I've only had three jobs in my life. I was a lifeguard for a summer. I parked cars for a year or two, and I've been in the health and fitness industry. Mm. And I can't see myself doing anything else for the rest of my life. I'm a coach, whether I'm coaching people on how to lose weight or how to have the confidence to go and speak to a woman or how to create their own brand or their own business. I'm always coaching people. I'm coaching my kids. I'm coaching my friends. I'm coaching myself. And this is where I call myself this health hacker. But really, I'm breaking into what I don't know. And what you don't know, you don't know. So you have to keep learning. You have to keep empowering and educating yourself. And I have this thing, what I call the upward spiral of success. Well, this was something I fought for many years is the downward spiral of negativity. Well, I decided to kind of change the verbiage on it. And the more you can create momentum in a positive way, the more creation, the more abundance, the more success you're going to have. But it took me a lot of years to get here. So people who know me, who work with me, or have seen me online in a video, they know that I really do preach more than anything is finding your why. What is your purpose? Why is this going to drive you? Because I had no why my freshman year in high school. I didn't have a why enough. You hear Michael Jordan's why, he got cut from the basketball team. That was enough for him to say, somebody doesn't think I'm good enough. Well, 
what am I going to do? I'm going to shoot 20,000 jump shots. I'm going to play basketball every day of my life. And that's where he got his drive and success from. Mm. Well, I didn't have that at that time. So I look at life as if I was Michael Jordan, right? What did I fail at when I was younger? What did I not get right that I could make up for now? And that's teaching other people not to go to, my kids will never quit anything in their life because they won't start anything till they know it's right. And once they do start it, they're going to put so much purpose and passion into it that they would never want to quit. The hardest part is just getting started. Turning up. Yeah, turning up. That's it. Okay, so let's talk about that why. You're, you're out there hustling. You're doing the, the valet. You're doing all that. You know, you're making good cash money, then you're working at the gym. You like working for yourself. You like being in control of your time. You like making the money. But did you know your why at this stage? At what point did that why come to you? Or is it sort of something that you've learned looking back on life? So I've always found ways to make money. That's never been a challenge for me in my life, whether it was baseball cards or bottle rockets or finding ways to teach people how to make paper airplanes. I remember for mm -hmm. a summer, that was a gig of mine where I could teach you how to do it for a dollar, I could do it for you for two dollars. And the one I would make you for two dollars would fly better than yours, but you didn't know how to make it. So right. you know that was a entrepreneurial hustle of mine. And so it's never been money. Even now today, you know, I got bills and I got dreams and I got things I want to do. It's, it's never, you can't be successful in life if you're only driven to the money, or at least you can't be in long success, in the marathon of success. So money has never been something that's a driving force. It, it, it does help. And like I tell people, it makes things more comfortable, but by no means can it be your primary driving force. So for me, it was seeing my mom, seeing her be healthy, seeing her exercise, seeing her be happier, seeing the time that I would spend with her. And it was, it was great. You know, it only lasted a few years. And, and people that do know my story know that my mom unexpectedly died in 2004. And that was a extremely challenging time in my life where I chose – the negativity. I chose to go down that downward spiral. I chose not to be successful. I chose to hide my emotions and my feelings with alcohol. And I probably could have died. I probably could have gone to jail because a lot of my friends did both of those things. And I came out of it. And I didn't come out of it alone. I fortunately had my high school sweetheart, who I've been married to now for 11 years, but have, has been a part of my life since I was in seventh grade, we grew up together. And she always believed in me. And she was like, you know what? I think the shit that's happened to you your last couple of years of your life is your fault. And if mm -hmm. you want to change it, you can. So she really inspired me to dig deep. So we got married in 2006. And at this time, I had kind of shifted away from the health business. And I was in real estate, as most Americans were in that boom. 03, 04, 05, uh, I was there, especially living in Hawaii and California. Again, taking ownership in that entrepreneurial spirit, realizing though that this was not my passion, right? Yeah, I could go in and fill out some documents and find a property that no one was interested in and flip it and make a hundred grand, but like really, where where is that my true why? It's not my why. So we got back into health and fitness in 2006, and it was at a time where I needed it most because I had been living a life full of toxicity, whether it's food, whether it's alcohol, whether it's the lack of sleep, whether it's the fact that I wasn't doing my job as a husband or as a father or even as a friend. Whereas now, my primary focus each and every single day that I wake up is to serve other people. There's a reptile in the garage. He lives here. <laughs> We've named him Scully. Uh, he lives here. So my daughter was obviously a little scared of that. <laughs> my purpose came when I came back to serving other people to give them the same higher quality of life that I've been able to transform from. Mm. And that's been my primary goal ever since. So in 06, 07, 08, we opened one of the first CrossFit gyms in Arizona, CrossFit Scottsdale. We were very – early adopters of this methodology and we believed in it strongly and that kind of worked its way in for a few years 
always doing things just a little bit outside of the norm, outside of the box. So if people taught CrossFit classes at a regular gym, we decided to one-up it and teach a yoga class. If people decided to teach a yoga class, then we decided to bring in a karate class. So we always wanted to do things that were just completely outside of the norm and different. And then in 2009, I had the opportunity to be a brand ambassador for this company called SickFit. And if you don't know about SickFit, SickFit's like the Hurley of the competitive fitness world. And I was just a guy who was rocking the clothes, and I was really good at the sport of fitness at the time. And it was really awesome to be able to do all these things at a young age, knowing that ideally my life was going to be about teaching other people. So we, we, not, we hammered those two things out between CrossFit and, and SickFit. And we started to open up gyms, multiple gyms, and we were really close to pushing play on franchising. Mm. And what we realized, again, was that it didn't serve our purpose. It didn't serve what we wanted to do. It didn't serve what I wanted my life to be filled with. I didn't want to hop on an airplane, travel across the country, be away from my kids to teach somebody how to open a gym because I felt like there was so much more to the way we were teaching and that it probably couldn't be duplicated. If it could be duplicated, it couldn't be scalable. So for all my entrepreneurs out there, you're going to hear that word. How do you scale? How do you scale? How do you scale? Well, right now, I don't, and I don't want to scale. Hmm. I want to serve the people that I have in my life, and I want to serve them with everything that I possibly have each and every single day and worry about the rest later. So everything starts with that purpose. Everything starts with that why. If I can teach my kids how to live a better life, I know – if they're going to teach their kids, if I can teach my son what it's like to have a father and a role model who's around each and every single day, then I know there's a better chance that he's going to teach his son and so on and so forth. Mm. So well, I'm able to have these amazing, absolutely amazing relationships and conversations with people that I don't even know, the person who cleans the hotel at the hotel room, the person who makes my Starbucks, the person who wipes the windows. I... Because I'm on such a – I don't want to say like a, a grand scale or a magnitude that I feel that I'm different than anyone. But because I've kind of let everything go in my life to serve everyone else, mm. I feel that I'm able to go absolutely anywhere and do anything that I want to with the freedom to be happy and along the way to carry and take as many people with me. Mm. It reminds me a lot of – there's a book by Derek Sivers – called anything you want and he says it's either hell yeah or nothing yeah. you know you either say hell yeah or nothing and i think you've kind of made that decision yourself and it's a really powerful lesson your story for entrepreneurs is that to grow you have to say no to a lot of things i know we live in a world where we have to say yes to a lot of opportunities but you've also been very conscious and clear about what you will not do and that's really tough because i think we as entrepreneurs like to gather and grab every opportunity and chase every rabbit right but you've consciously said like moving from your franchise opportunity to where you are now you've said no to stuff and said hey look that's not exactly what i want and it's like i don't have time to waste right i'm going to do exactly this so i'm curious to know how this has emerged into the fittest tribe alive. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about this because this seems like the emergence of your true purpose, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, so fittest tribe alive really is a collection of experiences that will allow you to live a higher quality of life. Those experiences are the foods that you eat. They are the exercises that you complete. They are ways to practice mindfulness and meditate. There are things that we do where we travel and go on these experiences where we hike Kilimanjaro or go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon or hike to the top of uh, 14ers in Colorado and Haleakala in Maui and all do these different adventures. Really what I saw missing in the health and fitness space was experiences. Mm. You go to a place, you exercise, you leave. At best, that place is comfortable, there's a community there, and your kids can walk around barefoot. At best, some of those people become your friends, and then they end up coming back to your house, and they become lifers. But what I noticed, at least with the way that 
I was living and the people that were in my life, was my, my friends were my family and my family was my business and my, we built everything sort of around this lifestyle. And I mean everything. I've never missed a kid's diaper change. I've never missed my kid's school performance, a practice, a pick-me-up because ideally that's top priority for me in my life. Hmm. regardless of the accolades or the awards or the money or the people that I can help, I got to help. Number one priority is I got to take care of my family. And I do that first with everything else coming around that. So it was like, all right, it's January, 2016. What are we going to do new? Well, let's teach people some of the things that I've learned, like going to seal fit or going to a mad mud run or a tough mudder or world's toughest. Well, let's teach them how to train for it physically, emotionally, uh, psychologically. Let's get them the right gear. Let's get them the right fuel. Let's teach them how to eat. Let's train with them. Take it a step further. Let's build a team on it. Wow, that's awesome. What do we want to call that? Well, it's a tribe of people. We're pretty fit. Wow, why don't we call it the fittest tribe alive? I like that. That rings. What do you guys think? Works well. Everybody dug it. Great. What does the Fittest Tribe Alive do that, say, a gym doesn't do or another brand doesn't do? Well, we not only teach people how to do these things, but we say, look, we're going to go and do them. And on top of it, why don't you come and do it with us? So not only are we going to teach you how to train and prepare to hike something like Kilimanjaro or Haleakala, but we're going to give you all the tools behind it. We're going to give you all the training. We're going to coach you along the way, the same way that you and I are interfacing in different countries and different continents around the world. We do the same thing using technology, whether it's a text, an email, a phone call, or a video. And we nudge people along the way to ensure that they're being held to what we like to call extreme accountability. Mm. Most people, like myself, my freshman year in high school, gave up because somebody wasn't going, nah, no, no, no. Sorry, it's not happening. It's really easy to give up on yourself. I hate to say that, but it is. It's really easy to do that. But when you have a coach, when you have a father figure, when you have a mentor, when you have a boss, when you have parents, when you have people, and I hate to say it again, standing over you, you're not going to give up on them. You may give up on yourself first, but you're not going to give up on the person standing next to you. And I saw that a lot with a lot of the military kids that I was training is we would take the focus off of them and put it on the person next to them. And they would be able to continue for hours longer than if it was just them. Mm -hmm. So the tribe was created based on giving people every possible tool and life hack to live a higher quality of life, to be healthy, to be fit. Ultimately, I don't know if you got this at all in, in some of your research, but my goal is to live to be 100 years old. I want to be a century and I want to live to be 100. So I'm teaching people a lot of these same principles like learning and understanding what the blue zone is all about so that they can also live a long life. Not teaching people how to have six-pack stomachs and you know 16-inch biceps because now I'm closer to 40 than I am 21. So those things don't matter to me anymore. What matters is staying on this earth as long as I possibly can, functioning as well as I possibly can, teaching and learning as long as I possibly can along the way. Right. I know so, you mentioned the blue zone, living to 100. And it's interesting yeah. that, that all that research, I know a lot has focused on lifestyle and food and, you know, just eating whole, you know, whole foods, eating healthy, all this kind of stuff, right? General exercise, regular activity. There's a big part of it as well, which isn't really talked about, which you've kind of touched upon, which is really interesting, is that how important staying socially active and staying part of a community is for long life, right? And how, you know, like they do these studies down in Okinawa and the island of Japan, and they look at these these 100 plus year old women who, you know, are dancing with other people, you know, the other women, they get together on a regular basis and they have their little sing-along and stuff like that. They stay socially active. And I'll bring that back to your tribe and you talk about the, the, the military kids as well. You know, how important having goals which are tied to people beyond ourselves is, right? Because, you know, I think when we set goals, a lot of it is self-focused. Like, I want to do this. I want to do that. I wanna, I'm going to achieve this and become that, right? But you are sort of, coaching people to say, think beyond that, right? It's not just about you. 
and you are getting people to tie your goals to people around you, right? And I'm just wondering what kind of impact that has when you get people to do that, because maybe that's something they haven't thought of doing before. You know, I'm going to go on this 10,000 mile bike ride, right? You know, that's the kind of thing that people have as a goal to do. But when you attach it then to other people, I'm doing this bike ride to help these kids to raise money, that kind of thing. It changes your why and your motivation, right? Yeah, we, we talked a little bit before the show about Tony Robbins and his impact and his legacy. Well, he has all the money in the world. He's worth half a billion dollars. He doesn't need to do the things he does. But his goal in life now is to feed a billion people. Hmm. That, that's his goal. So the money does matter now because the more money he makes, the more he's able to help the people who need food. So you can kind of see how that sort of circle works, right? It's no longer about him and making money and paying the bills and, and feeding himself. It's now about feeding other people, which gives him the same drive that he once had, the same fuel and fire. So if we talk about the blue zone and what these people have in common, if you guys don't know, I wrote an article on it, but there's lots of information growing about these concentrated areas around the world that some of the scientists highlighted or circled with a blue marker of people living well past the age of 100 and the things they have in common. One, they eat mostly vegetarian feed. Number two, they eat a lot less than most people, eating one or possibly even two meals a day because obviously eating digestion is a high stress exercise. It puts your body through a tremendous amount of stress. They live near or around a body of water, whether they swim themselves in the ocean or they dive in a pool in Loma Linda. They believe, and we're not talking about religion, but they believe that there is a source of higher energy and higher power other than themselves, and they have a community of like-minded individuals. That's it. That's it. There, there's not a lot else to it. So if you can find a way to do those four things, eat less. I do apologize. Exercise is in there somewhere. Movement. Like you said, I, the term you used, I think you said, what would you call it? Less stress exercise? Yeah, like gentle exercise. Just, you know, not, yeah. 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 The key word, gentle exercise. So I, I pounded my body for seven years doing CrossFit, six years playing football. And I saw people well into their 40s and 50s who did and who did not train that hard. And the ones who did not, the ones who walked regularly and swam, were looking much better than the ones who pumped iron. Hmm. So you got to have that balance. And the key ingredient to all of these things there is that there's a community of like-minded individuals doing the same things that you choose to do. So finding those groups, finding those communities, and, and some of them did find church. That was a key point, but a, a lot of them found community. A lot of them found just other people that kind of bought into the same system. Hmm. And there's nothing more that I want in this world for myself. Not the money not the houses, not the cars, none of that. I want to live to be 100 years old because I know if that happens, then everything I've worked towards has come true. It means that all the stuff that I've studied and all the work and time and energy I've put in into eating the right foods at the right times and exercising the body and the mind, keeping the mind as strong as your biceps, that it's worked. And if that's worked, then my kids have also worked because they're in their 70s or 80s. I would love to see three or four generations of Kayams running around this world. <laughs> what are you going to be doing at 100? Have you ever thought about what that's going to look like? Do you visualize that? Or is that just sort of a, a far away goal that you're well, working towards? Every time my shirt is off, my kids remind me that all the tattoos I have covered across my upper body are going to be melted into one when I'm <laughs> And I said, you know what? When I'm 100, guys, it won't matter. <laughs> so I do. I do start to visualize that. And, you know, studying a lot of people who believe in something, that that's their life goal, that that's their marathon. I'll use Gary Vaynerchuk as the example here with buying the New York Jets one day. Like he talks hmm. about weekly. He talks about buying this $4 billion asset as his life goal. We're in the marathon game. Hmm. So – I, I think it's probably a good idea if in this next year or two I do create a visual as to living to be 100 years old. Maybe I put it in my calendar, my Google calendar of 2078. 
Okay, right with reminders every five or ten years. Right, That's some pretty cool hacks that we could do to that. Exactly, exactly. That would be awesome to see. Do you? I mean, I know you talk about extreme accountability and how powerful that is with the people around you. You know, putting your goals out there, you set yourself up for failure. Now, I want to I want to sh- talk about this because I think you know, in sort of summary, this is a really key point about your story: is that you're not afraid of failure in the sense that you're not afraid to try something, and you sort of accept that failure is part of the process, right? And that's why you've been a successful entrepreneur. That's why you've been so successful in what you're doing in fitness as a coach and so on. But I think one thing that people struggle with is failure. You know, they kind of like the idea of being an entrepreneur and having their own business, but you know, I've got to leave a comfortable salaried life. I've got a family. You know, how do I do what Luke's done or is doing? I want to go out and do that stuff, but I've got a mortgage to pay, right? And I'm not sure my wife is going to like the idea of me starting a a fitness business. Yeah. How do you get started on that? Because I know you, you, this whole thing about just get started, just show up, right? Where is the point at which you can just show up and get that thing going? So it starts with your why. Why do you want this? You can't you can't even respond with what you want before you can say why you want it. And if you want a successful uh, fitness business, then we have to ask why. Mm. Why is well? What's your story? Well, I want a successful fitness business because I've lost a hundred pounds exercising, and I believe that I can teach other people how to lose a hundred pounds. That's your why, right? Uh, I'm writing a book right now called It Starts With You. And it's really a book on teaching dads how to live an uber high quality of life while raising kids Mm. and being married and being successful in whatever business they may be. And I'm constantly reminded that I have had a lot of failures, but I'm going to have even more. You can't be afraid to fail because not only are we going to try to change and rewrite the word failure, we're going to change it to temporary defeat. But if your mindset says, I can never fail, I can only just make mistake or, or not make it or keep going or that's a speed bump or that's a challenge or that's an obstacle and I can overcome those things. If you can change the way you think about it, then you'll be able to change that outcome. So I've missed a lot of shots. You know, I think right now where I am, I've obviously failed more than I ever have before in my life. But I've also succeeded at that exact time. Right? They say that in your darkest moment, right when you're about to quit, is when you're closest to actually succeeding and breaking through. Mm. And uh, there's a great Napoleon Hill book. A lot of us know Napoleon Hill from Think and Grow Rich. But I just got done reading a new book of his. And a new book is in the last 10 or so years. It's been surfaced, but it's called Outwitting the Devil. Mm. And the entire book, the entire book talks about how every single day of our life, Our mind tells us no, no, because we're afraid. We're afraid of fear and we're afraid of not becoming successful. We're afraid of failure. So fear and failure is what drives our emotional state more than success and happiness. It's crazy. Yeah. It's so true. So So I take a lot of shots. I mean, I I, I take a lot of shots. Not only am I, uh, you know, uh, uh, call it 40-ish year old testosterone still filled husband father and entrepreneur but i want to do these things to show my kids like that's really what i'm doing Mm. is like i'm showing these kids look look what dad's gonna try i'll tell you something right now and i just i won't share this with my wife quite yet but i'm doing things that are completely rewriting my code meaning i'm doing things that are so uncomfortable that are so outside of my comfort level and that are within reach that it only makes me want to do more things like it and here's the example here i don't sing i don't have a great voice but i don't sing i played sports in high school and friends of ours are having their 10 year wedding anniversary here in maui in june so i decided to go and get singing lessons on a weekly basis so that i could hack a love song with my family and my friends in Ma- – I'm performing wow. phone in front of a large group at a luau at this nice 10-year uh, anniversary party with my friends because I know just by doing that one thing, not only am I having to go outside of what really is comfortable for me. 
I'm breaking all of that. I'm completely breaking through any restrictions, any doubts, any negativity in my mind that says you can't and you shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. So you said, you know, how fear is uh, a driver towards success more than, you know, all the other things that we think are key to us becoming successful. Fear is, is can be a really powerful energy, right? And, you know, I'm reminded of this whole idea of rejection therapy, where you consciously put yourself out there into situations where you can fail and that you fear, but you're in control. So that's how you, you know, that's how you break through. It's not like you defeat fear. It's like you, you surf the wave, right, of fear. You become comfortable with it and use that energy to become better, right? And you've consciously put yourself out there in this situation where you could stand in front of a crowd, this congregation and sing and just kill everybody with your voice because it's so awful right but you've said right i'm going to go out there i'm going to take lessons i'm going to you know i'm going to push through this right and for a lot of people that's just you know i mean that whole public speaking thing is one thing but singing in front of a crowd of people wow you know good on you and i'm just really curious to see how the results go but you've consciously (laughs) put yourself in that situation that's amazing you know the next phase of my life uh, is I want to stand on stage and I want to continue to coach and teach and empower people to break through. And I know in order for me to do that, I have to constantly be yeah. finding ways to break through myself. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love this image. I just want to finish up. There's this image. And we go back to Kilimanjaro. I put this into context, that conversation, you go back as well to college years when you're having that conversation with the coach or not as the case may be, you're standing three feet behind your your buddy who's telling the coach that you're not turning up anymore, right? And then you're on the top of Kilimanjaro and you're holding up this sign or you're, you're shouting on the video going, daddy made it. Yeah. Right. That was the, you know, that was what came to your mind. That was the most important thing to say at that moment, right? Yeah. How does it feel, that whole sort of arc, that journey, when you think about these two scenes in your life and put them together, transpose them, and you juxtapose them, right? And you, you put these two things together. I mean, how does that make you feel when you place these two moments in your life together? It was, you talk about the yin and the yang, the black and the white. It was such a positive energy that filled with my body and obviously i didn't know what i was going to say my gopro almost didn't make it literally like i had to change the cart out two hours earlier at sunrise it's 8 30 in the morning i've been carrying all this gear with me and i reached the summit and i pull the gopro off my forehead i turn it around and i said you know canon and camille my kids it, it doesn't matter what happens in this world if people say you can't do something this is proof that you can do it no matter what. And I stood on top of that mountain. You could hear my scream. My primal scream <laughs> will probably be with me for my entire life because it was so magical and it was so powerful. And it really did lift a lot of the curtains that were kind of hanging, which we go back to my freshman year in high school. We're talking 1992. Mm. So this is a long time ago. But you hear people – Uh, stories of this, you know, whatever it may be, haunting them their entire life. When I die, whether it's at 80, 90, or 100, I don't want any haunts. I don't want any ghosts. I want to know that I did absolutely everything I possibly could from the time I shake someone's hand to the time I kiss my kids goodnight and absolutely everything in between that I have no regrets, I have no remorse, and that I don't take anything back, that I live this entire life with every bit of energy, delivering purpose, passion, and positivity wherever I go and whatever I do. That's Luke Kayam, everybody. Well, a complete inspiration. I've loved having you on the show today, Luke. Luke, where do we find out more about you? So you can check out my personal website at lukekayam.com. You can also check out thefittesttribealive.com. I'm doing a lot of Facebook Live videos where I just talk about certain subjects And I'm really enjoying those. So you can see over 65 Facebook Lives that I've done specifically since I got back from Kilimanjaro. And I had a new bit of fire with me. 
And uh, I'm committed to doing those throughout the year. And now I'm taking them and putting them on my YouTube channel and kind of getting those out. But those are the ways to see me, of course, on all social media. You can see me as well. And you can see me on Mount Everest in 2020. So, Graham, we'll have to talk about that next time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm looking forward to that already. So, well, we've got a, we've got a long way to go. I mean, we're going 100 and beyond, right? So Mount Everest is just a starting point. There's plenty more. I'm sure on the horizon, things that you've got crazy adventures. Luke, I would love you come back on the show in the future as well and share your journey with us. It sounds like you've got so much coming up and so much to share and you've been an inspiration to me. I think the listeners as well today. That's Luke Kayam, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Graham. Appreciate it. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sport business. Find out more at www.endurancefm.com.